All right, hello there, United States history students. In the past couple of lectures, we learned about how the United States of America began extending its influence over other countries and becoming an empire. We learned about the very important role that Theodore Roosevelt played in expanding American power. So we have the Spanish-American War of 1898, we have the Filipino-American War of 1898 to 1901, we have the Roosevelt administration, which follows up from 1901 to 1909, and then we have the Taft administration, that was a single-term presidential administration, and then we have Woodrow Wilson and World War I. And if there was any event that made the United States of America one of the most important powers in the world, it was our involvement in World War I, which, by the way, wasn't called World War I at the time. It was called the Great War because they didn't know that there was going to be a second World War at the time, of course. But it's interesting. The First World War was a war that not many Americans wanted the United States of America to get involved in, especially the President of the United States. So why does the United States get involved in this war? What are the consequences of our involvement in the First World War? And how does our involvement influence the future of American history and the future of world history? That's a little bit of what we'll be learning about in this particular recorded slideshow lecture. Woodrow Wilson, let's start here. He was the president from 1913 to 1921. He was a Democrat. He was a progressive. He was, for a relatively brief period of time, the governor of New Jersey, so many Americans associated, associate him with being from the North, even though he was born and bred in the South, and he's very much a Southern man. He was an individual without a lot of political ambitions, yet he ended up the most powerful, or in the seat of the most powerful political position in the United States. He's president. So who was Woodrow Wilson? How does he become president of the United States of America? Well, let me briefly back up to where we left off on a previous a previous lecture, the election of eighteen or the election of nineteen twelve. Election nineteen twelve was a very important election because you had three big name candidates. This is different from most elections in American history, most presidential elections in American history, because you usually have the big two candidates, the Republican and the Democrat. Very rarely do you have a prominent third party candidate. And in 1912, not only is there a prominent third-party candidate, but that third-party candidate is a, is, a, is a former president of the United States of America. So if you remember, election 1912, you had Woodrow Wilson, who was the Democratic candidate. You had William Howard Taft, who was the Republican candidate and the incumbent, incumbent president of the United States. And then you had the former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who used to be a Republican, then formed his own political party, which was called the Progressive Party, but then it got renamed the Bull Moose Party. It, well, that's actually not particularly accurate. He, it, it was the Progressive Party. It just was nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. And there you go. There are your three candidates. So it was a pretty impressive ballot in the 1912 election. But as you remember, all that really happens because of Theodore Roosevelt running again for president was he split the Republican ticket. And because it was mostly the Republicans that were split between Taft and Roosevelt, all this did was just open the door for Woodrow Wilson to get elected the 28th president of the United States of America. And because President Wilson is our president during the First World War and we get involved in the First World War, President Woodrow Wilson will play a very significant role in shaping the history of the 20th century. So before we get into all that, let's look at his background. So Woodrow Wilson was born in Virginia. He was born in the year 1856, so he was a very young boy when the Civil War was going on. And he will grow up in the South during the Reconstruction era. And this plays a very important role. These experiences of growing up in the South during the Reconstruction era, they play a very important role in the formation of some of his ideas, especially regarding race. He was born in Virginia, but his family moved around a little bit. Uh, he did spend some time growing up in um, South Carolina and in Georgia as well. His dad was a minister, and Wilson came from a long line of ministers. So Wilson is a very Christian man, or in other words, his Christian faith 
also becomes an important aspect of his personality and his way of thinking and the way he approaches problems and how he tries to solve problems, as we'll see later on when he's president of the United States. Now, growing up, when he goes to school, when he becomes a, a, a young man in college, he spends some time studying at Davidson University, which is north of Charlotte in uh, North Carolina. And then he also studies at Princeton University. He ends up becoming a lawyer. And it's interesting how he became a lawyer. This very much reflects Woodrow Wilson's mind. Wilson was a brilliant intellectual. He was an academic at heart. He loves books. He loves learning. He loves research. He loves the life of academia. That is where he is most at home. And Wilson will prove to be a very brilliant scholar. As a young man, he was also a rather sickly young man. He spent a lot of time, sadly, in bed sick. And so when he became a lawyer, he was studying at law school, but he had to actually drop out of law school. He actually never graduated law school because he was so sick. But because he's so smart and he's such a scholar, he studied everything he needed to pass the bar exam so that he could practice law, and he did it. I actually don't know if you can do this today to become a lawyer, if you can just skip law school and take the bar exam and become a lawyer. I don't know, but I don't think you can do this today. But Wilson did that. So he goes on to become a lawyer, and he's a terrible lawyer. In fact, there's no evidence that he actually even took a case. So he's not actually that good in a courtroom, if he even made it into a courtroom. So he gives up on the courtroom, and he goes back to the classroom. So he becomes a professor of political science at his own stomping grounds of Princeton University, which is in New Jersey. And it's in the classrooms of Princeton University that Woodrow Wilson finds his niche. He finds what he's good at. He's a fantastic and engaging professor. He is a great public speaker. He is a fantastic debater. He's also, for what it's worth, tall. He has a bit of an aristocratic air to him. He's articulate. He's eloquent. He captures the, atten the attention of his students. He's so smart. He's so knowledgeable of politics and history that eventually people start feeling, wow, you'd be a really great politician. Imagine if we had somebody smart like you as president of the United States. In the late 19th century, during the rise of the industrial, bar the industrial capitalists, the, the robber barons, Wilson envisions a, a United States whose future rests on progressive reform. The job of government is to protect the people from the excesses of capitalism. He believed that the big businesses, like Standard Oil, like U.S. Steel. They needed to be broken up. There needed to be more competition. He believed in protecting, that the government's job is to help protect the well-being and health of everyday Americans. He believed the banking system needed to be reformed. He believed that tariffs needed to be lowered so that more goods could be imported, so that there would be more competition, and that all these things would benefit the American people as a whole. So Wilson identified himself as a progressive. But Wilson would say that his progressive attitudes came from his Christian faith. Wilson came from a long line of ministers, and to a certain extent, he is himself a Christian minister. Just like the people in the social gospel movement, like William Gladden, or excuse me, like Washington Gladden, and Jane Addams, he believed that it was a Christian's duty to care for all people. He also believed it was a Christian's duty to work to create peace on earth. And now Woodrow Wilson expresses all of these ideas in a way much more eloquently than I just did. He infused these ideas into his teachings of American politics and history. And people hear this and they think, wow, you should run for public office. And it's not too long until the Democratic Party in New Jersey thinks, hmm, Maybe he would be good for political office. Before he made it to political office, Woodrow Wilson did go on to become the president of Princeton University. Now, one thing that's important to talk about with Woodrow Wilson in regards to what he does while he's at Princeton is that he writes a multi-volume, five-volume set on the history of the American people. And in fact, the title is quite simply A History of the American People. And here's an image of the first edition of the history of the American people right here. Now, what's important to know about this particular history of the American people is this. It's fairly racist. 
So we remember that Woodrow Wilson was born in 1856, a few years before the Civil War. And so he grew up in the South as a white boy in the Reconstruction era. So he experienced the enfranchisement of African Americans, African Americans for, for the first time in American history, acquiring the right to vote, having some political power, beginning to have a say in their own destiny, and then the rise of the Jim Crow South, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and then eventually the election of 1876 and the Compromise of 1877. Wilson experienced all this within the first 20 years of his life, and Wilson absorbed the attitude of, well, white supremacy. He saw the empowerment of African Americans as a threat. He believed that really only white people were capable of running society. So in his history of the American people, he celebrates the Ku Klux Klan as restoring good, traditional, white Southern culture by scaring African Americans away from the polls and away from better jobs and away from civil rights. And of course, the KKK did more than scare. They terrorized people. They killed people. They lynched people. So this is another very important part of Woodrow Wilson's attitudes and beliefs that we see emerge when he becomes the president of the United States of America. Okay, so Wilson becomes the president of Princeton University. He then goes on. I mean, his, his rise in politics is pretty meteoric because he goes from being president of Princeton to being the governor of New Jersey to becoming the president of the United States in 1913. It was a fairly quick rise. Now, when he runs for president in 1912, he promotes himself as being a progressive president. His focus is to reform the United States of America. He really only expresses interest in domestic concerns. We're going to make the United States of America a better place. After he's elected and he takes the oath of office and he gives an, his inaugural address, he says in his inaugural address that we Americans are very proud of our industrial achievements, but we have not hitherto stopped thoughtfully enough to count the human cost, meaning the time has come to take care of the average American citizen. Now, for what it's worth, this is his rhetoric throughout most of his 1912 campaign. And so that focus on improving the lives of everyday Americans actually gets the support of some African-American voters. In other words, he wasn't necessarily seen as a racist on the campaign trail in 1912. So he gets elected, and the first thing he does is begin sweeping progressive legislative reform. So Wilson gets elected president. With his support, Congress passes the 16th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which creates the federal income tax. He also supports Congress in passing the Clayton Antitrust Act. Wilson didn't believe that the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 went far enough, so the Clayton Antitrust Act sort of made some improvements to bust up the trust in the monopolies to create more competition among businesses. Wilson helped create the Federal Reserve, the goal of the Federal Reserve was to stabilize the banking industry in the United States of America, to help stabilize the economy. He also helped to support the creation of the National Park System. Sadly, John Muir died two years before that happened. And also he helped to oversee the creation of the National Highway Act. So by the time we get to the 19 teens, we have enough cars that it becomes important that we have essentially national roads or highways. Previously, it was the job of states to create roads, and the National Highway Act empowered the federal government to begin linking up cities with national highways. And probably the most famous highway that gets created out of the National Highway Act under the Wilson administration is a road that connects Chicago, Illinois, with Los Angeles, California, and that is Route 66. We'll talk a little bit about Route 66 in this class. It's a very famous American road. It actually goes beyond LA. It goes to Santa Monica Pier where it dead ends right at the Pacific Ocean. All right, so let's take a look at Woodrow Wilson's cabinet. No surprise, Wilson fills his cabinet with other liberal, progressively minded individuals. Now, one of the things that you do when you become president of the United States or what is a tradition to do when you become president of the United States 
is you provide cabinet positions with other people in your party who have been losers in the past. So for example, if somebody from your president or somebody from your political party has run for political office and lost, one of the things that you may do for this person is give them a job in your cabinet. So if you could think back to the late 19th, early 20th century, and if you can ask yourself, has there been any Democrat who's run for presidents, run for the presidency multiple times, specifically three times, and three times lost that presidential election? You might think, oh yeah, William Jennings Bryan, our fiery populist speaker. Well, William Jennings Bryan gets a spot in the cabinet of Woodrow Wilson. Specifically, he becomes the Secretary of State. The Secretary of the State is our chief ambassador. So the Constitution of the United States empowers the president to send ambassadors to other countries, to greet ambassadors from other countries, and to make treaties with other countries. The treaties must be ratified by the Senate, but the president may make treaties. And as I say that, I'm thinking in the future of Woodrow Wilson's administration here, Wilson will be remembered for working hard to sign a treaty with other countries after World War I, but the Senate has to ratify the treaty. That becomes an important element of the Woodrow Wilson administration. So, but I bring that up here because the president obviously can't go visit a whole bunch of other countries and he can't always be available to greet ambassadors. So this is the job of the Secretary of State and that is what William Jennings Bryan does. It's also worth mentioning at this point in time in the lecture that William Jennings Bryan, like Woodrow Wilson, both very Christian men and they believe that part of their Christianity is avoiding war. These two men love peace and they want to avoid war at all costs. So there they are, William Jennings Bryan and Woodrow Wilson. Now when Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated in the year 1913, his wife was Ellen, but sadly one year into the presidency, Ellen died and Woodrow was grief stricken by this. However, he did, before the end of it all, <laughs> when he was still president, he did remarry and he, rem and he married a woman named Edith. Woodrow Wilson's second wife, Edith, will also play a very important role in his administration, especially during his second term. But take a moment to look at this picture here. This is a very interesting picture that we have. This is actually Ellen and Woodrow Wilson on Inauguration Day in 1913. And you see, in a day and age before, while well, there were many cars, the president and first lady-elect are riding in a horse-drawn carriage, being driven by two African-American drivers. Wilson's personal racism emerged during his presidency in how he supported segregation, and specifically the segregation of federal jobs. So federal jobs had been desegregated since the administration of Ulysses S. Grant in the 1870s. So any federal organization like the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture, the Postal Service, African-American, mostly men, would be working along with, Afri with, with white men. There was no segregation. There was integration. This had been going on for over 40 years. Along comes Woodrow Wilson and says, nope, desegregate. So white people White men, mostly men at this point in time in history, white men and white and African American men, they are now no longer going to be able to work in the same in the same space, and this equates to African Americans not getting the better jobs, therefore not getting the better pay, and this is a major step back in terms of civil rights. Woodrow Wilson speaks to this and says, "Racial segregation eliminates the possibility of friction in the workplace." In other words, he justifies it by saying. We can create peace between blacks and whites by not having blacks and whites interact with each other. After Woodrow Wilson's two terms as president, when we get into the 1920s, we will see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK becomes very prominent, as you see here in this particular picture, which was taken in the 1920s. This was after the Woodrow Wilson administration. They become very public. They become very visible. They are marching through Washington, D.C. here in the middle of the 1920s. Now, there were several factors that led to the rise of the KKK in the 1920s, and Woodrow Wilson's racist attitudes 
were only one of those factors. Now, one of the big cultural phenomenons of the 19-teens and the Woodrow, and Mil Woodrow Wilson administration was, well, first of all, the rise of automobiles. We see this happen in the 19-teens. So America is starting to look a little bit more like modern America, what we're familiar with today. But then also there was the rise of movies. Movie houses came along and were really big in the 19-teens. Americans became obsessed with movies, were still obsessed with movies. So let me tell you a little bit about movie culture in the 19-teens and kind of what it was like to go see a movie in the 19-teens. So first of all, movie theaters at the time were single room movie theaters. So there was only, you know, one screen and one movie playing at a time. The multi-screen cineplexes, they don't come around for, well, quite a few decades after this. And the movie theaters would tend to show multiple movies throughout the day. So they wouldn't just be showing the same movie repeatedly on this one screen. There would be multiple movies that they would show. And the movies at this point in time in history were silent films because they hadn't figured out how to put a soundtrack onto the reel of film. We don't have soundtracks on film until the year 1937. And the very first film with a soundtrack was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the Walt Disney film. So because you didn't have a soundtrack, you would have characters on the screen, the actors, and you would see them looking at each other and maybe talking to each other. But then if the filmmaker wanted to communicate to you what was being said or what was happening, if that wasn't clear, was there'd be a title slide and you would read what somebody was saying to another person. But then for dramatic effect, and if you look at this movie house from the 19 teens and you look beneath the screen, they would usually have musicians perform the music to accompany what was being what was being seen on the screen. So I mean, think about this. This gives the musician in the movie house a, a lot of sort of creative license to play whatever it is that he or she wants to play. So if you went to go see a movie in Columbus, Ohio, you may have one pianist playing a particular song that he felt matches you know what was going on in the screen. But then you went to the same movie in Cincinnati, and you'd have another musician, usually a pianist or an organist, playing a completely different soundtrack. So it's kind of neat. And there are stories of how, you know, as the musicians got to know the film, sometimes they would play things differently at different, at different times. They'd mix it up. So hopefully you're getting a sense. Going to see the movies back then, it was very different, or at least a little bit different than going to see them today. Okay, so they played multiple different movies throughout the day. If you wanted to, you could pay your nickel or dime or whatever it costs to go into the movies. And if you wanted to, you could sit there all day. This becomes a popular pastime during the Great Depression. If you could actually get into the pay, afford to get into the movie theater, why not just go all day? And some people, especially if you're out of work or if you're a kid, some people did that. Okay, and then one last thing about uh, this movie-going experience of the 19-teens. In between the movies, in between the movies, they would sometimes play these cartoon shorts. So I mentioned Walt Disney before. Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse, whose original name was Steamboat Willie, he originally emerged as a cartoon short, this little funny animated thing that would play in between the movies. And the other thing that they would show in between the movies was something called newsreels. Newsreels were the news. So far as I know, they don't really show the news or have any news before movies today. We usually see trailers for other movies before we see a movie today. We see the you know, advertisements for other movies, but we don't see news. But in between the movies, they would show these newsreels. Now, this makes sense if you think about the, this time in history. There's no television yet. There's no radio yet. Radio doesn't come along until the 1920s. So the only way that you get the news is from newspapers. So the newsreels were a big deal. Whereas before the newsreels, you would read about the president of the United States doing something or a particular baseball team winning the World Series. And now you go to the movies and you actually get to see images of these things. And so this becomes important because when the First World War breaks out, Americans are going to read about the First World War, but then they're also going to be seeing images of the First World War on these newsreels before and after movies in the movie theaters. All right. So one of the biggest, most important films of the 19-teens was this one. 
It was called The Birth of a Nation. This is one of the most significant films in American history for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's an action and adventure film. There's good guys, there's bad guys, and the director of this film, D.W. Griffith, does a really good job of exciting the emotions of most of the viewers to cheer on who identifies as the good guys to go get the bad guys. We're Americans, we tend to love our big budget action adventure movies, and this one really set down the formula for the first, one of the first original action adventure movies. So The Birth of a Nation. But what's interesting it was the topic. The topic of The Birth of a Nation was the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan is featured in this film in a very positive light. It was a story about the Reconstruction era of American history. And in the Reconstruction era, there were African Americans. And the African Americans who are portrayed, as you can see by this particular still frame from the, from the movie, the Africans were, uh, African Americans were played by white actors in blackface. And they were monstrous. In the film, the black men are seen as trying to rape white women. And so here comes the Klan. And the Klan is acting out of chivalry to protect their white women and to protect their traditional white Southern culture and to keep the black man in his subservient place in society. In some movie houses across the United States of America, when this movie played, and you get to the scene that you see here where the Ku Klux Klan captures the evil doing black man, some people in the audience would chant, lynch him, lynch him, lynch him. So this is one of the first great action adventure films in American history. It is also one of the most racist films in American history. And it's probably, I would say, the most famous racist film in American history. Not that there aren't plenty of other racist films after this, but it's certainly the film that jumps out in my mind when I think of the most racist film in American history. Now, so this film comes out in 1915. Woodrow Wilson is the president of the United States of America. And if you remember, this is a silent film. There's no soundtrack. So when the filmmaker wants you to understand something about the context of what you're seeing, or if the filmmaker wants you to know what somebody is saying to another person, they have to have a title slide go up. And in the, birth of the, in the film, The Birth of a Nation, there is a quote from Woodrow Wilson's book, A History of the American People. Now, probably not a lot of people actually read that book, especially not all five volumes of it, but certainly millions of people see The Birth of a Nation and they read the words of the President of the United States. And in the film, they quote Wilson. The, and, and remember, this, the, the, the context of the film is the Reconstruction era and the rise of the KKK. So here's Woodrow Wilson's quote in the film. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South, to protect the Southern country. This film did a great deal to enhance racist sentiments in the United States of America because films are very powerful, powerfully emotional. I would think as an art form, films, maybe even more than music, do a lot to encourage a particular sentiment within us. And this film encouraged Americans to be racist. And the fact that this film incorporated the words of the president of the United States at the time did even more to encourage this racist sentiment. So, Again, this is one of the reasons why the Ku Klux Klan starts making a comeback and a very public comeback in the 1920s. So now back to the Woodrow Wilson administration. If we could go back in time to the year 1913 and Woodrow Wilson is taking the oath of office, we would hear from his inaugural address about how much he wants to improve life for the average American in the United States of America. That's his focus, domestic reform. He wants to implement antitrust laws and lower tariffs so there'll be more competition among businesses, lower prices. He wants a Federal Reserve to begin regulating the banking industry. His focus is on domestic policies. He wants to improve things within the United States of America. He does not have much of an interest in world affairs, and he even proclaims it as such. He says, 
It would be an irony of fate if my administration had to deal chiefly with foreign affairs. Funny thing is, fate has a way of being ironic and that he, his presidency will be defined not really so much for these domestic reforms that he makes, but rather for how he deals with the rest of the world. Now, when we think of the Woodrow Wilson administration now, we think of World War I. But before World War I, there was a major conflict that we had with another country, and specifically the country just south of our border, Mexico. So, beginning, so let's talk about Mexico here for a second. So Mexico, beginning in the year 1911, had a series of revolutions. The central government in Mexico City was very unstable. And in 1911, they had a president of Mexico who had a pretty corrupt regime. He had been president of Mexico since the year 1876. So that's what, 35 years? And this presidency was so corrupt and there were so many Mexicans living in poverty that this is pretty much the recipe for a revolution. There was a revolution against him, and then there was another president. But then that president soon became corrupt, and then there was another revolution not long thereafter. And this is what Mexico is going through as we enter into the years of the early 19-teens. Now, if you're Woodrow Wilson, what do you do in this situation? Do you just let Mexico do whatever it is they're doing? Their problems are their problems. Or do you in some way try to intervene maybe a little bit to support a democratic regime that works, that's not corrupt, that's politically and economically stable? Well, so Wilson decided to get involved in 1914. He proclaimed, not just to Mexico, but to all of the countries south of our border, I'm going to teach the South American republics to elect good men. Wilson saw it to be in the interest of the United States of America that Mexico and other Latin American countries were democratic and economically stable and politically stable. So let's start with what Wilson does in the year 1914. So in the year 1914, there is a man who's ruling Mexico. He's the president of Mexico. His name is Huerta. You don't have to know his name. His name is Huerta and Wilson doesn't like him. He's corrupt. He's a dictator. And so Wilson decides to do something about it. Where it says having guns imported into Mexico to support his regime. And so Wilson says, here's what we're going to do. The United States of America is simply going to blockade Mexico and stop these guns from coming into Mexico. So the United States military is stationed in the city of Veracruz along the Gulf of Mexico in Mexico. They have the right to be there. But then several American soldiers... They're off their boats. They're in a part of town that they're allowed to be in, but then they venture into another part of town where they're not allowed to be in. They are arrested, and they seem to be in a little bit of trouble, but then there's some diplomatic action that happens, and these American soldiers are released. So then, when the Mexican military is returning these American soldiers to the American naval commander who's stationed in Veracruz, they do so peacefully, and they also issue an apology for arresting these American soldiers who were actually in a part of town that they weren't allowed to be in, even though it was totally an accident. These men didn't know they were allowed, weren't allowed to be in this part of town. But anyway, the Mexicans offer an apology. We arrested these men. We're sorry. The American naval commander said, I want you to salute the American flag. So we had the American flag raised in Veracruz, and he said, you salute the American flag. This was done just to humiliate the Mexican military of officials who had returned the American soldiers. And the Mexican officials said, no, we're not going to salute the American flag. Because these Mexican military officials did not salute the American flag, this is used as a pretense for an invasion of Mexico. So the American naval commander had wired Wilson and asked, may we invade Mexico? Wilson gave it the green light because he doesn't like the guy who's in charge in Mexico City. So the Americans invade Mexico. They march from Veracruz to Mexico City. Wilson also wisely reached out to other South American countries, namely Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. He got their support. They said, we don't like the president of Mexico either. Go ahead and do this. And so the president of Mexico, President Huerta, was deposed by the United States of America. And a new guy takes power with the support of the United States. His name was Carranza. You don't have to know Carranza either. But his name was Carranza. And the Americans like him and support him and had installed him. But then he proves to be corrupt as well. 
And in the end, Wilson didn't like him either. Actually, I shouldn't say in the end, because Wilson will flip-flop on this guy several times. At first, he likes him because he has him installed, and then he doesn't like him because he begins ruling like a dictator. But then, actually, later on down the road, Wilson will like this guy because he'll be more cooperative with the United States of America. Anyways, it's very, very complicated. All these presidents of Mexico, they all seem to rise up in power, and they have the support of the people, but once they have the power, it's really a case study of how absolute power corrupts absolutely. And they really even shouldn't be absolute dictators. They're presidents. They're elected. But the system of Mexico is so corrupt with so many rich landowners having so much political influence that the presidents never really seem to be able to represent the people. And this Carranza guy was no different. So when Carranza is in power, then in Mexico, there were militia movements that rose up against him. And of all the militia leaders, the most famous was this man, Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa is one of the most well-known and colorful figures in Mexican history. And he plays a rather important role in the story of American history, of United States history in the 19-teens as well. And there's a lot of, sort of romantic mythology built up around Pancho Villa. He's such an interesting guy. It's worth getting to know him a little bit. So Pancho Villa is usually identified by American historians as a bandit, as an outlaw, a guy who robbed people, robbed trains, and stuff like that. Pancho Villa didn't identify himself in that way. He identified himself as a general and as a man of the people who fought for the poor and the downtrodden. So the image of Pancho Villa in Mexico was sort of like a Robin Hood figure, a guy who would steal from the rich and give to the poor. We don't know a whole lot about Pancho Villa's background and childhood because most of what we know comes from him, and we know that Pancho Villa used to embellish his own story. But if he is to be believed, he first began operating outside of the law when his sister was hurt and he came to his sister's rescue. So in Mexico, there are these really large estates, what we would probably call a plantation in the United States of America. Uh, they were called haciendas in Mexico. And Pancho Villa's sister was working at a hacienda, and the man who owned the hacienda raped her. Now, Pancho Villa wasn't there, but he heard about this violation of his sister. And so Pancho Villa goes to the hacienda and kills the man. Now, for Pancho Villa, this is justice, but he ju did just commit murder, and he murdered a very wealthy and powerful man. Pancho Villa was 16 years old. He'll now spend pretty much the rest of his life living outside the law as an outlaw, as a bandit. When the revolutions break out in 1911, he plays a very important part of the revolution. He actually, as a military commander, studied the military strategy of the Apache Indians in the American Southwest. How the Apaches fought and how Via fought was like this. They'd get shotguns, they'd get horses, and they would charge their enemy at full force, full gallop on their horses, blasting their shotguns as they go. It is a very difficult thing to do. Not that I would know, but I could only assume a very difficult thing to do to go charging into battle full gallop on a horse and be blasting a shotgun with any accuracy. But it was terrifying to be on the receiving end for this of this. But Pancho Villa and his men, they would attack the rich men in, the, in their haciendas who were supporting whatever corrupt president of Mexico was around at the time. He would also rob trains at one point in time, he robbed a train and took enough gold and silver off the train that, was, that would have been worth about $3 million in American money today. And he would use this money to fund his army, to buy guns and ammunition, and to provide food for the poor Mexicans that he said he was fighting for. So this is Pancho Villa. He's one of these great outlaws in American history. As I'm talking about him, I'm thinking of Billy the Kid in our own country's history. Somebody who was you know, a murderer, he was an outlaw, but at the same time, you sort of like him because he's fighting for the people. Pancho Villa himself, uh, he didn't drink alcohol, he didn't smoke, he didn't do drugs of any sort. When he was with his militia, he ate with his men. So even as he would he had identify himself as a commanding general, he didn't really think he was above anybody. Now, one of the reasons why Pancho Villa is so well known today is because he made himself during his lifetime a celebrity. And here's how he did it. 
In the 19 teens, you had a burgeoning movie industry in Los Angeles, California. Hollywood is just starting to be born. And movie producers in LA reached out to Pancho Villa south of the border in Mexico and asked him if they could film him, if they could make a movie about him. So Pancho Villa, and this is true guys, it's absolutely bizarre. Pancho Villa allowed American filmmakers to come down into Mexico to film him in an actual battle. So Pancho Villa is going to go into battle. This isn't a setup, he's actually fighting. And to work cooperatively with the filmmakers, he told them, listen, I know you've got to film this, so I agree only to fight between the hours of 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. so you can get the best shots of me and my men fighting. This happens, movies are made, Pancho Villa becomes a celebrity on both sides of the Rio Grande, and he really was really the first reality show star. We don't have TV yet, so we can't call him a TV reality star, but a reality movie star? Anyway, this guy is very popular. So, back to Woodrow Wilson. When Wilson doesn't like this new President Carranza guy down in Mexico, he says, well, I knew, now know who we can support. Pancho Villa. So Woodrow Wilson dispatches the highest ranking military commander in the United States Army, a man by the name of John Pershing, General John Pershing. He goes down south of the border, as you see here in this picture, to meet Pancho Villa. So as you look at this picture right here, Pancho Villa is right in the middle. And then to Pancho Villa's left, to our right, is General John Pershing. These two men meet. Pancho Villa is now on friendly relations with the United States of America. This won't last, by the way. Pancho Villa receives some military equipment from the United States of America. And so he can continue his campaigns against Carranza's regime in Mexico City. But then... This president of Mexico that Wilson first did like, then he doesn't like, well, now he's doing things to make Mexico politically stable. So when the year 1916 rolls around, the federal government of Mexico is on friendly relations with the United States of America and aid is cut off to Pancho Villa. But from Pancho Villa's perspective, nothing has really changed for the Mexican people. They're still struggling. They're still poor. Most of them are still living in poverty. No, we're still going to go after the rich guys and their haciendas. And because the United States of America is now supporting the Mexican president, Pancho Villa is going to begin attacking Americans. So Pancho Villa was really good at robbing trains. And this, his first attack on Americans actually happened sort of by accident. He didn't go into this with the intent to kill Americans, but he does kill Americans. So in Western Mexico, just like in the Western part of the United States, there's still the same Rocky Mountain chain. And in Western Mexico, just like in Western United States, there are all these gold and silver mines. And Americans had been purchasing these mines in Mexico so that they could go mine gold and silver down in Mexico. They, of course, in order to do this, had to have the permission of the Mexican government. So it was in January of 1916 that Pancho Villa and his men rob a train. In the process of robbing the train, they're killing people and they killed 16 Americans. These men were mining engineers. So they're not the owners of the mine, they're not the big wigs, these are engineers that are there to scout the land, to dig the mine, and to you know, do the engineering work necessary for getting these minerals out of the ground. But Pancho Villa has now killed them, so 16 Americans are now dead at the hands of Pancho Villa and his bandits. Now, you might be able to pass that off as an accident, but the next thing he does is so audacious, there's no way that this is an accident. He invades the United States of America. Pancho Villa and his men cross over the border. They go into New Mexico, and they go specifically to the town of Columbus, New Mexico. Yes, New Mexico has a Columbus, too. It's not as big as Columbus, Ohio. It's a small little town. But he goes into Columbus, New Mexico, and he kills 17 civilians, and then he disappears back south of the border. Now, if you're the president of the United States, don't you have to respond to this? There's a Mexican bandit. Yes, you once supported him, but he's now a bandit and he's killing Americans. And he's launching terrorist attack south of the border into New Mexico, into the United States of America, and he's killing random civilians. So Wilson wants to send the United States military south of the border, invade Mexico, find Pancho Villa, 
and kill him or bring him to justice in some particular way. Wilson, of course, contacts the president of Mexico. Hey, President Carranza, is it okay if I invade Mexico with the United States Army <laughs> to capture Pancho Villa? Carranza's like, yeah, Pancho Villa is no friend of mine. Go get him. So leading the American invasion into Mexico in 1916 is the highest ranking commander of the United States military and the one individual who has met Pancho Villa, General John Pershing. Okay, so let me take a moment here to talk about General Pershing. General Pershing's nickname was Blackjack. And the reason why he was called Blackjack was because when he fought during the Spanish-American War and he fought in Cuba, he commanded a regiment of all African-American soldiers. So if you were a black man in the late 19th and early 20th century, you could join the United States Army but you fought in your own segregated unit, and that segregated unit had to have a white commander. And because General Pershing was one of these white commanders of an all-black unit during the Spanish-American War, he earned the nickname Blackjack. Hey, just so for what it's worth, African-Americans in the military. Um, African-American men were not allowed to fight in the United States Army in between the American Revolution through about halfway into the American Civil War. So there were African Americans that fought on the side of the Continental Army uh, against the British during the American Revolution. And then after uh, we win the revolution and we become our own country, African Americans were not allowed into the military until we get to the American Civil War. And then after the Emancip uh, Emancipation Proclamation of, uh, of, of, of 1862, uh, African Americans are once again allowed to be in, uh, allowed to fight for the United States Army, and most famously in the American Civil War, there was the Massachusetts 54th Regiment that fought for the Union during the American Civil War. So, just a little background on African Americans and their role in the United States military. This becomes important actually when we talk about World War One. The United States military is not desegregated until the Truman administration in the early 1950s. Okay, so that's who General Pershing was. So in between the 10 years of the American, or the Spanish-American War and this invasion of Mexico in 1916, General Pershing has worked his way up to being the commanding general of the United States military. And he was appointed by Wilson to lead an expedition into Mexico to find Pancho Villa. He had 11,000 soldiers plus 150,000 National Guardsmen to go and find Pancho Villa. They spent one year in the mountains, in the hills, and in the famous Copper Canyon of western, actually northwestern Mexico. Did they ever find Pancho Villa? No, they never got Pancho Villa. So there's no real victors at the end of this story here. The United States ends up humiliated. This Mexican bandit had outwitted the entire United States military. You've got an unpopular president ruling over Mexico. And Mexico as a whole, well, sort of feels a little bullied by the United States of America. Now all this kind of comes to an end in 1917 because it's in that year that the United States of America will enter into the First World War. And our issues with Me Mexico will, for the most part, go to the wayside. And Pancho Villa, whatever happened to him? Well, in the 1920s, in the early 1920s, Pancho Villa was in his early 40s. And when you reach your 40s, being a bandit isn't really the best lifestyle choice. So he actually struck a deal with the Mexican government. He would agree to cease from any violent activity in exchange for his own hacienda, and the top men of his militia would be allowed to live with him at his hacienda as his bodyguards. That was the deal that the Mexican government agreed to. And Pancho Villa lived like that for a little while. I believe it was like a couple of years. And then one day, he went into town with his bodyguards. He went into town in a car. And his bodyguards were in the car with him. But an old enemy of Pancho Villa, who knew that he might be coming into this town, had his men surround this car and fire a bunch of bullets into the car, thus killing Pancho Villa in one final fiery showdown. And from there on out, the, the, the name of Pancho Villa passes into legend. 
And that is the general story about how, during the early 19-teens, the United States of America and Mexico don't really have the most stable relationship. And this mild hostility that exists between the United States and Mexico comes into play within the larger context of what's going on in the entire world as the rest of the world is fighting the First World War. So what was the First World War? Well, back then, of course, it wasn't called the First World War. It was called the Great War. But it was clearly understood at the time, because it was being fought all over the world, that this was a world war. But of course, we don't call it World War I until we have a World War II. The Great War began in August of 1914, and it lasted until the armistice, or the ceasefire, of November the 11th, 1918. So this war lasted four years and three months. There were, around the world, approximately 10 million soldiers who will die in this war. There are, there are also an equal number of civilians that will die in this war. Why did so many civilians die in this war? They're not in uniform. They're not fighting. Well, sadly, civilians became targets during the First World War. Their cities were destroyed. They died in, in, in military attacks. Some of them were starved to death. There's even the first 20th century case of genocide, which happens in Turkey at this time. As we'll learn about, sometimes civilians are on civilian boat liners and these boats get shot out of the water. So civilians die in the same numbers that soldiers die during the First World War. So we have about 10 million military deaths, we have 10 million civilian deaths, and then over the entire world we have 40 million casualties. Now if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, 10 million plus 10 million is 20 million. How can there be 40 million casualties? Well, first of all, the 10 million military deaths and the 10 million civilian deaths are deaths. A casualty is anybody who's dead, missing, or wounded. And so that's more than just deaths. But, now, but since I'm talking about casualties, in the First World War, there's also a new type of casualty. And that casualty is called, at the time, shell shock. Today, we call shell shock post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. But shell shock was the result of modern industrialized warfare where you had human beings in such horrendous situations that their minds just snapped. Physically, their bodies were okay, but these individuals had nervous breakdowns and their minds broke from reality. And so that was a new type of casualty during the Great War that we'll learn more about later. So again, the First World War, Last for a little over four years, 1914 and 1918, 20 million deaths worldwide with 40 million casualties in total. It was a horrendous event. It's impossible to overestimate the impact of the First World War on history and on the future of the world and especially on the future of the United States of America. It was truly, truly a world war. It was fought everywhere. There was fighting in Europe, Asia, Africa, there were naval battles all over the world. It truly was a world war. Now that said, when we think about World War I, most of us think of Europe. And we think of Europe because the major principal battles that are turning point battles, most of them, but not all of them, most of them happen in Europe. Also, we Americans tend to think of Europe with World War I because that's where the Americans, this, that's where we go to fight. And then also World War I, began because of a stupid, silly event that happened in Europe. So here's where I need to keep myself in check a little bit because it's hard for me to not be subjective or offer my opinion when I talk about the outbreak of World War I. But I just, the outbreak of World War I was just so silly. It was so avoidable. So when we talk about like the causes for war, you know, there's usually one country that's aggressive towards another country. There's some harm that's been done. Or in the case of World War II, you had two very powerful countries like Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan that were expanding their territories and taking over other countries. And so, you know, it's very clear that there was a need to fight or to resist. There was clear provocation. But when asked, why did World War I start? What caused World War I? It's not... Well, it is easy to explain, but it's so stupid. It's so silly. It was completely avoidable. But yet, the war did happen. You have 20 million people around the world who died because this war happened. 
And because of that, there are very important lessons to be learned from, how, for, from the story of how World War I started. Okay, so let me do my very best here to summarize how this war actually got started. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a map of Europe and the countries of Europe in the year 1914 when the war broke out. Now, if you'll see here, I circled one, well, relatively small country. It's not too terribly small, but relatively small country in southeastern Europe in a region that is called the Balkans. It's a very mountainous country, and that country is called Serbia. So take a moment to find Serbia. Now, in the year 1914, some people in Serbia are scared, and they are scared of that big country that's colored in red that's right above Serbia called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, the reason why some people in Serbia are scared of the Austro-Hungarian Empire is because the Austro-Hungarian Empire is such a huge empire, it has gobbled up some of the other countries that were previously around Serbia. So Serbia, north of Serbia, there was, or actually, let me, let me not say north, let me say to the west of Serbia, there were a couple of countries, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and these countries were free and independent. And then Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they took them over. And so Serbia feels, uh-oh, we're next in line. The Austro-Hungarians, they're, they're coming to gobble us up and make us part of their empire too. So within Serbia, a terrorist organization forms. And on June the 28th, 1914, this Serbian terrorist organization, which was called the Black Hand, they killed the future emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The person who was killed was the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And this is the event that sparks World War I. A terrorist organization in Serbia called the Black Hand killed the future emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire on June the 28th, 1914. Okay, now if we could just pause history right here. This shouldn't lead to a world war. This is, a, this is not the Serbian government. This is a terrorist organization in Serbia that had half a dozen men go into the Austro-Hungarian Empire and kill the future emperor. This is a conflict between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia, and it could have stayed that way. And honestly, if cooler heads had have prevailed in both Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there could have been a way to diplomatically resolve this problem. But because this event happened, there was so much anger in the government of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there was so much fear in the government of Serbia that both sides started making these irrational decisions. And these irrational decisions will lead to World War I. So here's what happens. And it helps if you look at the map when I talk about this. This is sort of how the dominoes fall to create the First World War. So here's what happens. The government of the Austro-Hungarian Empire threatens to take over Serbia. The Serbian government, attempting to defend Serbia, calls upon a secret ally, another country that they have a secret alliance with. And that country is, to the north of Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Russia. So look north at Russia, see how big Russia is, and see how Russia borders the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Russia responds to Serbia, we'll protect you. The Austro-Hungarian Empire finds out about this and they think, uh-oh, big Russia to the north of us. If we fight Serbia, we've got to fight the Russians too. We need help. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire calls upon Germany and says, hey, Germany, if we go to war against Russia, will you help out? And the Germans say, yes, we'll help you out however you need to be helped out. The Germans then also call upon the Russians' old enemy, the Ottomans. So if you can find the Ottomans down in the lower right-hand side of the map there, the lower, or rather the southeastern corner of the map here, the Ottomans are traditional enemies of the Russians. They say, we'll fight. If you guys fight the Russians, we'll fight the Russians too. The Russians then, knowing they're going to have to fight three countries and three empires, they call upon one of their allies. On the other side of Germany, find France. The Russians reach out to the French. Now, the French hate the Germans. The French had just lost a horrible war against the Germans in 1871, and they want vengeance for that, for that war. So they're like, yeah, we're, we're willing to fight the Germans. And then when Germany finds out that France 
has agreed to fight, then Germany starts getting really nervous because now they're surrounded. On one side, they've got the Russians. On the other side, they've got the French. And the Russians, in July of 1914, begin lining up their army on the border of Germany to prepare for an invasion. And then there's Britain. So if you look north of France, uh, there are, there's the, the, the British Isles that are, that are colored in in red up there, uh, technically the United Kingdom. They're looking down at all this, and a decision is made in their capital city of London. A secret government decision is made that they are going to join in this war however they can because they feel that whoever wins this great cataclysmic European war, whichever side wins it, will determine the future of the 20th century. And the British want to be a part of this. Okay, so let's stop here. So what did you just hear? Well, hopefully what you just heard was this. A handful of terrorists kill a political leader. There's anger. There's a call for vengeance. People get scared that there's going to be a, a war. Because they're scared, they call upon all their allies. Allies join with allies. Next thing you know, all of Europe is ready to go to war because one man got assassinated. And do any of those countries who are getting ready to go to war, did they actually care about that one man? Was he significant to them and their country and their futures? No, not at all. So I want you to really understand that this war was not inevitable at all. This war is going to happen because of hot-headed politicians in each of these countries. And they were operating under the emotions of either anger and vengeance or fear. There was at this time some discussion, some talk that was happening between countries, in particular the countries of uh, the United Kingdom, England, uh, and Germany, and Russia, because both, or, or the Emperor of Russia and the Emperor of Germany and the King of England, they were actually, all three of these men, they were cousins. They were cousins. And they were talking to each other and communicating to each other, and they were literally saying, let's not fight, let's not fight. However, even though these three guys said they didn't want to fight, at the exact same time, they're listening to their respective military commanders, and the military, and the military commanders are all saying, we need to fight, we need to fight. If you don't fight, then your country's going to get invaded, and you're going to lose. But they could have continued diplomacy. They could have continued to talk. They could have found a way collectively, as powerful rulers of powerful European countries, they could have found a way to help the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia figure things out. But that didn't happen. Here is what happened. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated on June the 28th, 1914. Everything I just described in terms of the threats and the alliances and all that, all that developed throughout July of 1914. And then we go to August of 1914 early August of 1914. Look at your map. Look at Germany in the middle. The German government in Berlin is scared to death. They've got Russia on one side. Russia has already mobilized an army of over a million men on their border. They are ready to invade. They've got another enemy on the other side, France. France isn't as well mobilized, but they're getting prepared for war. The German government had to make a decision. Do we just wait and hope for the best? Do we just sit here and do nothing? Or do we make a move to defend Germany? Well, obviously, they made a move. In August of 1914, the German army initiates hostilities. This was directed by the German government to invade France through neutral Belgium. Belgium is not actually labeled on this map here. If you find Germany in the middle, colored in green, and you find France to the west of Germany, colored in blue, in between, or sort of in between those two countries, there is the pink country. That pink country is Belgium. And the reason why Germany invaded France through Belgium is because Belgium did not have fortified boundaries. So the Germans thought that they could literally just walk through Belgium and invade France. Once that happens, everybody goes to war. The Russians invade Germany. The Austrians and the Russians start fighting. The Ottomans and the Russians start fighting. Austria is invading Serbia. Serbia gets crushed, by the way. The British come down from the British Isles. They go into Belgium to defend the honor of Belgium. So the British were looking for an excuse to go into this war. Defending the honor and neutrality of Belgium was their excuse. They go down into Belgium to try to stop the German advance. So all of Europe is now at war. 
pretty much all of Europe is now at war. And because all of these European countries, or almost all of these European countries, have colonies around the world, in China, Japan, Southeast Asia, and in India, and in Africa, all of their colonies go to war too. So for example, the British have a colony of South, of South Africa. Right next door to South Africa is a German colony in Africa, and so they start fighting in Africa. The Germans also have a naval base in Tsingdao, China. So the British contact the Japanese and say, hey, would you like to be allies with us? And the Japanese Navy can go and attack the Germans in Tsingdao, China, and then claim possession of Tsingdao, China. And the Japanese say, sure, and they join on the side of the Allied forces, and they go and attack the Germans in China. So this war starts in Europe and then spreads all over the world. So these are the complicated beginnings of the First World War. Now, high school history teachers across the United States of America like to use this little acronym to summarize the causes of the First World War. They said there are four main causes of World War I. And this is a nice, easy, simple thing to help you remember the causes of World War I. The main causes. Okay. The M of Maine stands for militarism. Why did all these countries want to go to war when they could have solved this problem diplomatically? Well, because they believed in their militaries. Their militaries had, they'd invested so much money into their militaries, they'd built up their militaries so much, their militaries were so strong, there was such confidence in their, milita in their military. Their patriotism was associated with their military strength, and, and they wanted to show how powerful their country was by dominating another country in a military conflict because of this military fervor this leads to the First World War. Okay, the A of the main causes of World War I. A stands for alliances. Hopefully that's pretty clear based upon what I've been talking about in the past few minutes. If different countries hadn't been friends with other countries, then there wouldn't have been this alliance network. Had Serbia not been able to call on Russia or Austria be able to call on Germany, if those alliances didn't exist, well, we wouldn't have had a world war. We wouldn't have even had a European war. We would have had a conflict between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia. Okay. The I of the main causes of World War I. I can actually stand for two things. It can stand for imperialism. So because the European powers were also imperialist powers and they had colonies all over the world, a European conflict spreads to a world conflict and we have a world war. So I stands for imperialism. I can also stand for industrialism. And the industrialism goes with the militarism. We've got powerful new weapons of war, which make the First World War this atrocious war where you can kill 20,000 people in four hours in some battles, which actually happens. The Battle of the Marne, the Battle of the Somme, many of these battles that happen on the Western Front, just it's awful battles because of these new weapons of war. Heavy artillery, machine guns, poison gas, flamethrowers. This new awful technology creates this massive death in World War I, and that was possible because of industrialism. So I and the main causes, I usually stands for imperialism, but it can stand for industrialism as well. It can stand for both. And then the N of the main causes of World War I is nationalism. Nationalism, hyper-patriotism, Another fancy word for this is jingoism. A jingoist is a person who loves his country no matter what. This nationalist fervor that really builds up in 1914, people each believing that their country is the best, strongest, mightiest country, that patriotic nationalism also plays its part in creating a First World War or in starting a First World War. So those are the four main causes of World War I, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. And we find that in most high school classrooms across the United States of America, a lot of history teachers teach these four main causes of the First World War. Now, my own personal opinion of the First World War was it began for a completely stupid reason. There should have not have been a war. This assassination, as awful as it was, should not have led to a world war. If the heads of state of Germany, Austria, Russia, France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, if they had not, have been mo had not have been motivated by fear or vengeance, you know, had they been motivated by peace, there would have, there would have never been a, a First World War. But in that lies an important lesson in history. 
if one of the reasons why we study history is to learn from the mistakes of the past, to make sure that these mistakes never get made again, then the First World War offers us a very valuable lesson. We can look at the conditions that created the First World War. We can identify those conditions so that when those conditions arise again in history, as they inevitably will, we can make a different decision. We can handle the situation differently to avoid a future catastrophe. And it's in this vein that I introduce one of America's greatest historians. This is Barbara Tuckman. Barbara Tuckman was born in the year 1912, so she would have been only two when the war erupted in Europe. She would have been in kindergarten when the Americans were really involved doing a lot of fighting in 1918. But she would have grown up in the 1920s and then, in the, in, and then the 1930s, having heard so much about the First World War, she grew fascinated with it. And her fascination centered around this principal question, how could it have happened? Why would heads of state make these irrational decisions to start a world war when it was clearly so avoidable? So Barbara Tuckman was not a professional historian. She did her own independent research, but she did a great deal of research. She also worked very hard on the craft of writing, and she ended up a fantastic writer. And when she was 50 years old in the year, year 1962, she published her great work on how World War I began. The title of this book, you should be able to understand the title of this book based upon what you've just learned about the breakout of World War I. The title of this book is called The Guns of August. So World War I officially begins when, Aus when, when Germany invaded France through neutral Belgium in early August of 1914. So that explains the title. The content of this book is what's amazing because Tuckman wants to teach us the lesson of how this awful war happened so that we don't repeat the same mistake again. According to Barbara Tuckman, Here's why the First World War happened. She gives us essentially a recipe. If you have these ingredients, a cataclysmic war may break out. So here are the three ingredients. Here's why the First World War happened. Okay, first of all, she says you start with an atmosphere of fear. Okay, so there's a sense that, oh my gosh, our country, we're surrounded. Oh my gosh, there are enemies that want to destroy us. They're out there. So you start first with an atmosphere of fear. We're scared, okay? And then if you are scared, if you are fearful of an invasion or something like that, then your natural tendency is, as a political leader, to turn to the military. And you ask your military commanders, your generals, can you protect us? And if the generals say, we have the strongest, toughest military in the world, yes, we can defend you. Then you have that second ingredient of placing a great deal of confidence in your military and in your military leaders. And then the third and final thing is when the politicians and the heads of state, the government officials, they relinquish control to the military and they say, okay, we trust you. What do you want to do? And the military commanders say, we want to strike. And the government officials feel like, well, we don't have any other choice. We're surrounded. We've got enemies that want to attack us and they relinquish that control over to the military leaders, then it's all done. Then it's all done. And then you have a major war. And so this is why this is one of the greatest history books ever written, The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, because she provides us with a way out. Here's a way to avoid war. If we find ourselves with these particular conditions, if there's an atmosphere of fear, the government leaders, if they are smart, they can check whether or not this fear is consistent with reality. So they can possibly assume possibly best intentions from the enemy. Is our fear that we feel in our country justified? Is there a real and serious threat? Or is it to a certain extent in our heads? And if our enemy is actually lining up troops on the border preparing for an invasion, we can wonder, okay, why are they doing that? What pressures are they under to make that particular move? And instead of potentially operating under a condition of fear, a government can open up a dialogue with the other country to begin talking about why they're making the moves that they're making. And then the book teaches us 
to not place complete confidence in the military. The one thing that we have that happened in World War I is that all of the governments thought that their militaries were so powerful that they were going to win this war and this war was going to be over in six months and that every soldier was going to be home, every soldier that survived the war was going to be home for Christmas, that the war was going to be over by Christmas. And that was completely false. That was completely wrong. Military commanders, they can make mistakes too. But once a, a, a government sends out orders for an invasion to have their military attack another country, you can't really rescind those orders. Once you start the war, you can't really end it. You can't really say, oops, my fault, and just call it all off. And so you have to be careful in placing all this confidence into your military. So these are the lessons to be learned from Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. Now, her book was published in the year 1962. In the year 1962, the President of the United States actually read this book. And in October of 1962, the United States of America was under the threat of a nuclear attack. There was an atmosphere of fear. The military of the United States wanted to strike first. And the President of the United States said, wow, this sounds a whole lot like how World War I started because he read Barbara Tuckman's book, The Guns of August. And the President of the United States in October of 1962 made decisions to avoid another world war. So sometimes it helps to know your history. Okay, so let's begin this war. Once again, here's the map of Europe in 1914. You hopefully remember that there are the main causes of the First World War. And you should also know by now that the First World War started off as a conflict between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But the conflict of these two countries led to a chain reaction where these two countries called upon their respective allies and two different groups were formed. Two different alliances were formed. They're going to fight this war. There were the Allied Powers. The Allied Powers started with Serbia, who reached out to Russia. Russia reached out to France. And Britain jumped in on the side of the Allies. So those are the Allied Powers. Serbia, Russia, France, Britain. And then facing off against those allies were the Central Powers, which started off with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who called upon their friends, Germany, who called upon the Ottoman Empire, mostly because all three of those countries were all against Russia. And we have the formation of the Central Powers. They're called the Central Powers because they're located in Central Europe. So these are the two groups that are going to start fighting World War I. Of course, because most of these countries have colonies elsewhere around the world, it's going to involve the entire world, which is why this is a world war. Now, when the United States of America gets involved in this war, and first of all, the United States of America did not want to get involved in this war, and I'll talk more about that with Wilson later, but the United States of America tried to stay neutral, 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 because this war has absolutely nothing to do with us. What do we care about the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand? What do we even care if all of Europe goes to war? This doesn't have anything to do with us. So from 1914 through 1917, we are staying out of this war. But when we do jump in, we jump in on the side of the Allies. So there you see them, Serbia, Russia, France, and Britain. That's the side that we jump in on. Okay, this war begins in early August 1914, when Germany, feeling surrounded by its enemies, France and Russia, they decided to make their first move. The leadership in Berlin, that's the capital of Germany, they weren't going to wait for France and Russia to orchestrate a simultaneous invasion of Germany. They felt that the best defense was a good offense, and so they struck first. And in trying to make the decision, well, where do we strike first, Russia or France, they decided to strike France first, mostly because they saw France as being weaker. They thought they could take out France first, and then they could concentrate their efforts on fighting the Russians. This ended up being a colossal blunder. The French were actually the stronger military and the Russians were the weaker one, but they haven't figured that out yet. So the Germans implemented a plan called the Schlieffen Plan in which they invaded France through neutral Belgium. The reason why they went through Belgium is because Belgium had, had not fortified its borders. So the Germans literally thought they could just walk through Belgium. They did not expect for the Belgians to fight back. But the Belgians did, but the Belgians did, and the French army goes up into Belgium to stave off this invasion. Because the Germans were fighting Belgian civilians, Belgium did have an army, but it was a very, very small army. 
Belgium as a country didn't exist until the 1820s. And when they did come into existence, part of the agreement, the international agreement was that Belgium was to remain neutral in all European conflicts. So they didn't really worry too much about developing a military. And so when neutral Belgium was invaded and the Belgian civilians start fighting the Germans and the Belgian small Belgian army starts fighting the Germans, then this conflict, this conflict began being propagandized, mostly by the British, who said that the Germans had gone into Belgium and they were doing awful things like murdering babies and raping women and grossly exaggerating how awful the German soldiers had behaved in Belgium. The reason why the British uh, government was doing that, creating that anti-German propaganda, was to drum up support among the British people to go down into Europe to fight the Germans. So here is where the war begins. And pretty quickly what you have with the Germans versus the French and the English and a handful of Belgians is a stalemate. You can sort of think of, a, to use a football term here, you can sort of think of a line of scrimmage going through southern Belgium and northern France where neither side is really able to gain ground on the other. And so you have sort of a deadlock, you have a stalemate. Now, Belgium, if I can describe the terrain of Belgium here for a second, Belgium, if you ever visit it, it's a lot like central Ohio. It's very similar to the landscape around here, which is very flat. Um, also, Belgium in the summertime is very, very rainy. I personally lived in Belgium uh, for the summer of 1996. I lived in the city of Liège. You can actually see Liège on this map here. It's a little bit um, uh, east of Brussels, not too far away from the German border. That's Liège. And it rains a lot <laughs> during the summertime. It's sort of a dreary, they have very dreary, rainy summers. Okay, so what have you got here now? You've got a deadlock between two massive armies. You've got a very flat landscape and you've got rainy, rainy weather. How do you fight like this? Well, so that flat landscape is dangerous. You don't want to be standing in front of an another army <laughs> on flat land. So both sides started digging these elaborate trench networks. And this becomes the common image of the First World War. Men living and fighting in trenches like these guys here. So let's take a moment to look at this particular image. These are British soldiers, by the way. You can tell by the shape of their hats or their, I guess, helmet is the most more appropriate word here. But here these men are. They're in a trench. This is to keep them safe. And they are looking across the field. That field is called no man's land towards the other trench, towards the enemy trench that would be filled with most likely German soldiers. That field in between the trenches of the two armies is called no man's land because if you get up and you go over the top and you go into that field, you're going to get shot dead. So that's the no man's land. So that's also why you see the soldiers standing post with their guns there. Their job is to shoot anybody who attempts to attack their trench. Now you see the one guy with his head up a little bit looking over across no man's land. That was a very, very dangerous thing. Um, they developed periscopes so that you could look up over the lip of the trench without sticking your head up. Because even just sticking your head up makes you vulnerable to sniper fire. There were a whole bunch of facial injuries, really awful facial injuries in the First World War because men were sticking their head up uh, above the lip of the trench. And then the other thing you see in this particular photograph is the mud. World War I and the trenches of the Western Front, it was muddy, muddy, muddy. And that's because of all the rain in Belgium and Northern France. So this just led to an incredibly uncomfortable existence for these men. And standing in muddy water like this, sometimes your feet would be soaked for days. Now, you're familiar with what happens to your feet if you uh, keep them in the bathtub or the pool for too long, how they start to get pruned. Well, when you keep your feet wet for days like this, especially in nasty, muddy water, these men started developing some pretty terrible foot diseases, these fungi that would start growing on their feet. Sometimes they'd have to have their feet operated on. And these were but some of the horrors of living in a trench. So here are a couple more British soldiers that are, in, that are in a trench. You see that there's a shovel between them. It should be pretty obvious why they need a shovel. You can also see that uh, they fortified this particular trench, heightening it with sandbags, fortifying the sides with some corrugated metal and wood. They got a place to sit, possibly sleep, although sleep would be very difficult in a trench because you never knew when the attack was gonna happen. You could get attacked in your tent or in your trench day or night. And the attack would, would begin with an artillery barrage. These bombs fired from cannon 
on the other side that would land in the trench and explode. This artillery barrage, there's no way to defend yourself against it. And you're just sitting there. Who gets hit? Who survives? Who dies? Who gets horribly wounded? It's totally random. It's totally random. And there was just the terror and the anxiety of being in a trench, just waiting for the possibility of this to happen. But this is how trench warfare was fought. One side tries to blow the other men up in, in their trench so that their men and their trench can go over the top, which means climbing out of their trench, charging across no man's land, and capturing the enemy trench. That was the goal of trench warfare. It was very rarely successful because there was always then a counterattack on their trenches, and the front line of the war very rarely moved more than 100 yards or in one direction or the other, even after a major battle. And so you would have these major battles on the Western Front in Belgium and in Northern France, battles like the Battle of the Marne, the Battle of the Somme, the Battle of Ypres in Belgium, which is also called the Battle of Passchendaele. There were three of them. You'd have these battles, like the Battle of the Somme, where you had 20,000 men die in four hours and no land was gained. It was just this massive loss of life. And this is what makes World War I feel like an extraordinarily pointless war. First of all, why are these guys fighting? Why are their countries fighting? Well, really early on in the war, it's very simple and really stupid. They're fighting for the sake of fighting and for the... And, and, and to win. But even what is a win? It's hard to identify exactly what the end goal is for either the Germans or the French or the, or the British. They are fighting for the sake of fighting. And this is yet another element of the irrationality of the First World War. This is a particularly awful image of corpses in a trench after an artillery barrage. One of the things you had to deal with living in a trench were the rats because the rats would come out and feed on the human corpses. They would feed on the corpses in no man's land. They'd come crawling around in the trenches. Aside from dealing with a potential sniper hitting your face and trench foot, you also had to deal with the, the, the nastiness of these huge rats infest, in, infesting your trench. Okay, so let's go back to this big idea of why each side is fighting. Why are the allies fighting? Why are the central powers fighting? So, so the fight began because Germany was afraid that their enemies had, were going to attack. They'd already surrounded them. There were plans on attacking Germany. So they thought the best defense is a good offense. So they invade France through neutral Belgium. And that's how the whole thing starts. And then, of course, as soon as that happens, then Russia does invade the eastern part of Germany. You've got the Ottomans that begin fighting the Russians, the Austrians that are fighting the Russians. Austria goes in and invades Serbia. And then all the colonies go to war around the world. It all starts off just boom. Now. How do you end it? Now that it has started, how do you end it? What constitutes a win? So pretty much what does constitute a win is the other side giving up. That's it. When the other side has suffered so much and they lose their will to fight, they essentially cry uncle and they surrender and they give up. That's what constitutes a win. And there's a term that's associated with this. That term is a war of attrition. The First World War is seen as a war of attrition. Also, the Vietnam War will also be seen as a war of attrition. Both sides are fighting to see who will give up first. That's the First World War. Another important element of the First World War is the new technology that is used in the First World War. It's really the first major military conflict after the Industrial Revolution of the late 19th century, where we have steel, where we have mass production. And so there's this new modern equipment that's being used in warfare. This is completely changing the experience of a soldier who is now no longer charging into battle on, on a horse, saber at his side, firing a rifle or a pistol or something like that. You know, think of like 
George Custer leading men into battle at the Battle of Little Bighorn. That was 1876. That was just one generation before, less than 40 years before World War I. And now war has completely changed because we have, in all the countries have industrialized. So you have new things like this on the scene, the tank. So the tank was first developed by the British and they were used pretty early on in the war. 1914, uh, the Battle of Cambrai is where the tank made its first appearance. And the purpose of the tank was to go across no man's land. These tanks did not travel very fast. They traveled at approximately five miles an hour. So they just sort of crawled across no man's land. But it's an armored car, right, with these heavy treads on it. So it could go across the rough terrain of the no man's land, the barbed wire that was laid down in no man's land. It could just kind of crush through all of this to get to the trenches on the other side. It would have been horrible to have been one of the men in a tank in, world, in the First World War. Tanks will be developed in between the First and the Second World War. They'll be far more effective in the Second World War. In the First World War, they were death traps. If you got into one of these tanks and were driving it across no man's land to, fit to, the, to the trench on the other side, it was very likely you would have gotten killed and killed in a horrible way. First of all, there, were the, there was the exhaust from the tank that would go up into the turret so it wasn't all that easy to breathe in there. The bottom of a tank was particularly vulnerable, so if it hit a mine and it blew up, chances are you would cook inside of that tank. And the tank couldn't defend itself very easily, even though machine gun fire couldn't penetrate it. A well-placed enemy hand grenade into the turret, of the turret of the tank would, of course, blow you up inside of it. Tanks end up being very ineffective during the First World War. Hey, by the way, the reason why they're called tanks, when the English were developing them, they were these top secret things. And so they were all on, you know, some base wherever they were, had been made, and they were covered with sheets. People were curious what were underneath all of these sheets, and they were simply told, oh, those are tanks, maybe water tanks, maybe fuel tanks, and that's where the term tank comes from. Now, what's learned in between the First World War and the Second World War is that tanks need infantry support. So when you get to the Second World War and you have the tanks rolling across the field, you'd have infantry, these are foot soldiers, behind the tank. At the Battle of Cambrai, where the tanks were first used, the German soldiers thought they were hallucinating. They hear these loud, monstrous machines slowly crawling towards them across no man's land. They didn't know what they were looking at. Another new piece of military technology that had been developed before the First World War and had actually been used by the Americans against the Native Americans during some of the Native American conflicts in the late 19th century was the machine gun. It would take multiple individuals to work a machine gun, like these British soldiers that you see here. Machine gr guns made crossing no man's land extraordinarily dangerous because a couple of machine gunners could just swoop across no man's land firing any, on any attack on their trench, the machine gun. You also had these very powerful howitzers, these cannon, like this one. This was called the Big Bertha, developed by the Germans. It could fire an ammunition shell the distance of five miles. And of course, when these shells hit the ground and they exploded, killing all these men, creating these great concussions in the earth, the earth would thunder and shake. It was so loud and so terrible that the impact was sometimes heard a couple of hundred miles away. There were times there were people in London who could hear the war going on in Belgium. These powerful howitzers also creating or contributing to the, the horror and the terror of this war. Hopefully you can start to understand why a significant minority of soldiers suffered from shell shock during the First World War. Now, as you look at this huge cannon, you have to think, how, how could you ever transport something so big? So some of them were just hooked up directly to trains, like you see here, to get them as close to the front line as possible. And then there was poison gas. Poison gas was illegal, but that didn't stop anybody from using them in an attempt to win this war especially as the stalemate continued and both sides became more and more desperate to blast the other trench, blast the men out of the other trenches and advance their armies and win the war. And poison gas was first used in 1915, so not quite one year into the war, spring of 1915 in Ypres, Belgium. And the goal of poison gas is to you know, you fire it into a, the enemy trench and possibly it kills the men in the trench, but smoke, but the smoke itself might force the men out of the trench, enabling you to fire upon those enemy men as they crawl out of the trench, trying to avoid the poison gas. 
There were several types of poison gases that were used. There was chlorine gas. There was mustard gas that was called mustard because of its yellow smoke. These gases tended to attack the respiratory system, but it would also attack the moist parts of your body, such as your eyeballs. So a lot of times men who got hit with poison gas went blind. And so you'd have these awful scenes like this where men who survived the gas attack but had gone blind were being led out away from the front lines by somebody who could see. Now, fortunately, not all of these men are going to be permanently blinded for life, although it had to be pretty scary because you really wouldn't know at the time if you were permanently blind or not. But sometimes the cornea of your eye would repair itself and you'd be able to see again. Famously, one of the Austrian soldiers who was actually, he was, he was Austrian, but he was fighting for Germany, who got hit with poison gas and was temporarily blinded was Adolf Hitler, the future German dictator who will start World War II. He was temporarily blinded by gas when he fought in the First World War. Poison gas, yet another new technology that's creating a new form of warfare, which is making life for the soldiers extraordinarily traumatic and really taking the glory, if, if ever there was glory in warfare, it's certainly robbing warfare of any type of glory because World War I is increasingly not about the valor of the soldiers, but rather which side has the best technology. Okay, yet another new form of, tech, of military technology. So, the Wright brothers from Dayton, Ohio. They had their first successful plane flight in North Carolina in the year 1903. And they proclaimed that the airplane was going to be a great new instrument of peace. And largely they were right. I mean, the airplane has made the world a smaller place. We can now get on an airplane and travel hundreds of miles in a matter of hours. What used to take days and months to travel will now take just you know, half a day, really. I mean, with the airplane, you can get on an airplane if you can afford it. You can be almost anywhere in the world within 24 hours. That's amazing. This brings people together. This brings cultures together. This makes diplomacy easier. This makes us a more multicultural world. We can understand each other better. It's a, it is a fantastic instrument of peace, but just like any new form of technology, it can be manipulated to be used for warfare. The airplane is first used as an instrument of war in the First World War. It started off just being used for reconnaissance. So one plane would go up to look at the enemy troop positions on the other side and then go back down. Then it started being used to bomb those troops. Then both sides developed airplanes to go and shoot down the other airplanes that were being used for bombing and reconnaissance. So now we have two fighter pilots fighting each other up in the skies. This was called dogfighting. New technology had to be developed because it was very difficult to shoot a machine gun from an airplane. You had to, to rig the machine gun onto the plane so you didn't accidentally shoot your own wing off. Eventually, a plane was invented by a man whose last name was Fokker. And so you had a Fokker plane and these Fokker planes were designed where the machine gun would shoot bullets in between the propeller. There, there are no jet planes yet. The jet planes don't come around until after World War II. So everything's propeller-based right now. And these Fokkers would enable the pilot of the plane to point the plane in a particular direction. Wherever he was pointing, he'd press a button and the machine gun would fire in that direction. So you, you had to get directly behind your target. And this amazing new form of technology, it would fire the, machine, the, the bullets in between the rotations of the propeller. That was a Fokker plane. This was the most famous plane of the most famous dogfighter of the First World War. The pilot was Manfred von Richthofen, but he's simply remembered as the Red Baron. You can't tell from this particular black and white photograph, but his plane was, of course, red. But you can also notice that he has a triplane. Most of the planes in World War I were biplanes with two wings. Here you have the Red Baron's uh, plane, which is a triplane with three wings which enabled him to be a little bit more agile in the air, and, and, and this contributed to his success. Because Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was this daring pilot who would position himself in front of the enemy, giving the enemy the sense that, wow, I, I'm able to shoot the Red Baron out of the sky. 
But then he would use his triplane, which offered him greater wind resistance because he did have three wings. He'd put the brakes on these things, do a loop-de-loop -loop around behind whoever was pursuing him. The pursuer of the Red Baron would lose the Red Baron and get lost up in the sun somewhere above him. And the next thing you know, the Red Baron's behind him and the Red Baron shoots him out of the sky. Here is the Red Baron, whose real name was Manfred von Richthofen, who shot at least 80 planes down out of the sky, the most successful dogfighter in the First World War, but he also died in combat over France. And the Red Baron lives on today in legend. There's a frozen pizza company named after the Red Baron, and probably more famously, at least for me, the Red Baron makes an appearance, or made appearances, and Snoopy and the Peanuts cartoons. Snoopy was always fighting the Red Baron, and of course, the Red Baron always won. But now you know the story of the real Red Baron, or at least the Red Baron's significance in World War I. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to America's involvement in World War I. I haven't even gotten to how we get involved in World War I, but since we are talking about flying aces during the First World War, now is a perfect time to talk about this particular individual, Eddie Rickenbacker. I love talking about Eddie Rickenbacker simply because Eddie Rickenbacker was born and raised in the great city of... Columbus, Ohio. His family wasn't really all that well off and he had to drop out of school when he was only in the eighth grade. He was fascinated with automobiles, so he got a job in a garage learning how to work on automobiles. This was before the time of the Model T Ford, so, so automobiles were still very much a luxury item when Eddie Rickenbacker was a boy, just a teenager, and he learned how engines worked and he learned how to take engines apart and put them back together again. He learned all the things that you needed to know in order to be a mechanic on cars at this point in time. Fascinated with cars, he got into race car driving and participated in one of the very first Indianapolis 500 races. So he's all into cars and then comes along the airplane. If he was fascinated with cars as a teenager, he's even more fascinated with airplanes. So he becomes an airplane mechanic and a pilot. So here's the young Eddie Rickenbacker during the First World War, leaning against his airplane. It's a biplane. You may notice that uh, he has a particular insignia on the side of a plane. It's a hat. It looks like Uncle Sam's hat. It's all red, white, and blue with uh, stars and stripes on it. And the hat is in a ring. This relates to an old saying that when you were wanting to fight, when you were wanting to challenge somebody, you threw your hat in the ring. We usually say this today, if somebody is going to uh, run for political office, that they'll throw their hat in the ring. Eddie Rickenbacker, willing to fight in World War I, he's throwing his hat in the ring. And so he's got uh, his insignia of the hat in the ring on his airplane. All right, so as a dogfighter during the First World War, Eddie Rickenbacker shot down 26 planes, and he, unlike the Red Baron, ended up surviving the war. And I'll talk a little bit about his life after the war here when I'm done talking about what he did during the war. So I talked about how the Red Baron used his triplane to hit the brakes to loop-de-loop -loop around behind the plane that was pursuing him. So now he becomes the pursuer and would shoot down an airplane. Eddie Rickenbacker's plane was a little bit slower than uh, the Red Baron's and he didn't have a triplane. So he had his own method of engaging the enemy. And I will show you this message right, or this method right here and now. But first of all, you need to look at your screen and appreciate the high quality graphics that I have produced for you. Yes, there's Rickenbacker's plane. Please notice the hat in the ring insignia on the side of his plane. All right, so this is how Rickenbacker was successful. And let me reiterate, America's most successful dogfighter during the First World War. All right, so Rickenbacker's plane wasn't all that fast, and he doesn't have a triplane like the Red Baron. So what he would do is fly up really high, as high as he possibly could, so that way he could look down upon any potential enemy planes coming up from below, and he would do his very best to stay between the planes, the enemy planes, and the sun, so that the enemies couldn't see him very well. And then once he thought he was in the right position, he would essentially dive bomb him. And Rickenbacker would do this up and down thing, up and down. So he was either going down at the enemy planes or up at the enemy planes, and he found that this was the most effective way that he could fight and win. And for the most part, it worked. He shot down 26 planes, survived the war. After he fought in the First World War, Rickenbacker also fought in the Second World War. Famously, during the Second World War, he was in a bomber, and his bomber was shot down. He and his crew crash-landed into the ocean, 
where they were in lifeboats without food or water for 21 days. Amazingly, they survived it. In civilian life in the United States, he's remembered from both wars as being a war hero, but in particular, the First World War. He also started an airline company. It was called Eastern Airlines. It's no longer around today. Eddie Rickenbacker died in the early 1970s, and when, in one of his last interviews in the early 1970s, the interviewer asked him if he was ever still haunted by being up in the air during the First World War, afraid of being shot down, because it would have been a very scary thing to have been an airline fighter pilot, a dogfighter during the First World War. There are no parachutes yet. Many times the guys died in the plane when the plane got hit, it caught on fire and they cooked alive in the plane. That's why a lot of them carried pistols to shoot themselves if, the, if something like that did happen and they knew they were gonna die anyway. So this interview in the early 1970s asked him, you know, that does that still haunt you? And, and Rickenbacker said, yes, I, I still have nightmares. And the interviewer asked, well, when did you have your last nightmare about a war that happened over 50 years ago? And Rickenbacker responded, last night. There's the story of Eddie Rickenbacker. Let's go back to other new weapons of war during the First World War. And here's one in this picture, a blimp, or as they were called originally, a Zeppelin, named after Graf von Zeppelin, the man who designed them for Germany. Because Zeppelins were so big and slow and could so easily be shot out of the sky, they had to be supported by fighter planes. But the Germans did launch Zeppelin raids over England. You see this here. You see the Zeppelin isn't moving too fast or causing too much terrorism as some of the kids have stopped to pose for a photograph with them in front of this Zeppelin flying over their city. Another new terrible piece of war technology was the flamethrower. This is a French soldier carrying a flamethrower. That pack would have been around 70 pounds and if you got shot or if that pack got shot, it probably would have been a very quick but fiery death. But here's how flamethrowers were used mostly during the First World War. They would be used to create a smoke screen over no man's land and to kill everything on no man's land prior to going over the top. Flamethrowers were used during the First and the Second World War. They are now illegal to use in warfare as they are considered too horrendous of a way to kill somebody, to cook them alive. Another new form of military technology that makes its first appearance in the First World War, well, sort of its first appearance in the First World War, uh, the submarine. Uh, let me just qualify that, at least within American history. Uh, there were submarines that were used during the Civil War and during the American Revolution. There was an early prototype of a submarine that the Americans tried to use against the British. Uh, but submarines weren't really effective as a naval battleship during either the American Revolution or during the Civil War. But they were being developed. They sort of had early forms of a, of a submarine. But in World War I, they are very effective, especially the German submarines. German submarines were called... U-boats, if you speak a little German, the U stands for Untersee, and boat is, well, boat in English, it's just spelled differently, but Untersee boat, so the undersea boat, a submarine. And here's a picture of uh, a German submarine. Here is an artist rendition of a World War I German submarine. Just a couple of things about the German submarines during the First World War. First of all, the Germans found it necessary to use their submarines and rely upon their submarines because the British had such a powerful navy and the British blockaded northern German ports and the submarine was used to essentially slip under the British navy. They could go undetected out into the North Sea and into the North Atlantic where they could engage the British navy and sometimes other ships as well. Uh, the other thing about the, uh, about the German submarines, so let's talk about one of those ships right now. This is the HMS Lusitania. This is a British ship. It is also a passenger liner. If you look at it, it is not a battleship in any way, shape, or form. It is a passenger liner. And in May of 1915, it was traveling between New York City and England. And once again, it's carrying civilians, passengers. It is not a military transport vehicle. Now, in the spring of 1915, it would have been dangerous to be a passenger traveling from the United States of America to England because, of course, England is at war and everybody getting on the Lusitania was notified of that. 
including by the captain himself who made an announcement before they disembarked. We are traveling into the waters of a country that is currently at war. You are traveling at your own risk. The passengers knew they were traveling at their own risk, but at the same time, it's not like they're getting on a battleship. They're getting on a passenger liner. What possible harm would ever come to a passenger liner? You are in no way, shape, or form a threat to anybody. But sadly, when the Lusitania was but one day away from docking in England, it was torpedoed out of the water by a German submarine. The torpedo made a direct hit. This whole boat sank in less than 20 minutes. As you can see from the screen here, 1,198 of the passengers died. And of those nearly 1,200 passengers that died, 128 of them were Americans. There were 197 Americans on the ship total. So this is a terrible tragedy. I mean, just think about this. Imagine if there were Americans traveling on an airplane today or a boat today or just traveling or anywhere. They're in a hotel and 128 of them got killed. There would be outrage and there was outrage at this too. The Germans did this. The Germans acknowledged they did this. Why would the Germans do this? This is an act of barbarism. Are the Germans monsters? What is wrong with the Germans? What possible defense could they have? Uh, by the way, before I get into all that, here's an image of the Lusitania today at the bottom of the Atlantic. It was struck off the coast of Ireland. Here it is at the bottom of the sea. You can see how it's been crushed by gravity and the weight of the ocean. Okay, so back to this idea. Are the Germans these barbaric monsters? Are they living up to the British propaganda from, the, from 1914? Well, the German government offers its defense, which is this. The Germans have spies in New York City. They are Americans that are working for the German government. They are German agents living and working in New York City. They got intel in terms of what is actually being loaded onto the ship. And it was no secret that there were American manufacturing companies that were selling arms and am ammunition to the British government. And in the particular case of the Lusitania, there were thousands of rounds of ammunition that the Lusitania was shipping from the United States of America to Britain to be used in the First World War against German soldiers. So if you were a member of the German government, you found out that there's a boat that's sailing from New York City to England. It's carrying ammunition that's going to be used to kill your soldiers. What would you do about it? What would you do about it? You could say, that's a passenger liner. It's carrying civilians, innocent civilians. We just let that boat come into port. Or do you say, this is war. This is war. And the United States and Britain, and especially Britain because it's a British bro boat, they're not allowed to ship in these arms under a human shield. Actually, it wasn't arms. It was all ammunition on the Lusitania. So, but the British are not allowed to ship in this ammo under a human shield. If you are in the German government, what decision do you make? Well, they're nine months into a war that everybody thought was going to be over by Christmas and six months for the German high command. The better decision was to sink the boat. So that's why the Germans did it. But still, there is outrage in the United States of America and Britain as well. I mean, after all, there were 1,700 British civilians that lost their lives. They didn't think they were in that much danger. Okay, but this does highlight this Lusitania incident, which is important because it starts to tilt the Americans against the Germans in 1915. It certainly makes President Woodrow Wilson rather upset. We'll talk a little bit about Wilson's response here in a moment. But this is very important. The Lusitania in incident does highlight what the United States of America is doing at this particular time in history. This was a boom time for the American economy. The fact that Europeans are going to war, they need war material, and they're also going into debt to pay for that war material, this only benefits the United States of America. And here's how it worked. Everybody in Europe needs guns and ammo. The Brits, the French, the Germans, the Russians. Well, where are they going to get this stuff from? Well, they're going to produce it themselves, yes, but we over here in the United States of America we have industrialized, 
we have developed assembly line production, thanks in no small part, small part to Henry Ford. We can produce, produce, produce. We are a manufacturing giant in the early 20th century. And when World War I breaks out, we are more than happy to convert some of our manufacturing facilities into war manufacturing facilities. Guns, bullets, we can make these things and we can sell them to everybody. We can sell them to Britain, France, Germany, Russia. We'll sell our ammo and our guns to both sides because we are neutral. We are neutral in thought and in action. So whoever wants to buy, we're willing to sell. And we profited from the First World War. This was a boom time for American manufacturing. So much so that if you were a high school kid, you could drop out of high school and begin working in a factory and make enough money to put a down payment on a house and afford to buy a car. And you could get that with a factory job. Yes, it was a very different time in American history compared to today in United States history. So it was an economic boom time. Now, it doesn't end there. Eventually, the governments of Britain and France in particular they start running out of money to buy the ammo and the guns from the United States of America. So if you run out of money and you still need to buy something and you're desperate for it, then you've got to go to a bank and get a loan. Well, guess which banks they went to? American banks. So American banks are lending money to Britain and France in particular. Britain and France will then, after the war, have to pay these banks back with interest because that's how loans work. You have to pay the money back with interest. And this too is, ex is securing the economic domination of the United States of America. This is important to know. Our whole industrial era of the late 19th century, you remember Carnegie, Rockefeller, early 20th century, there's, there's, there's Henry Ford. We become manufacturing giants. So when World War I comes along, we can use this to our advantage. St sell stuff to the Europeans that need it, and then when they run out of money, we will loan them the money that they will pay us back with interest, and now they are in our debt. Do you see how the United States of America is rising up economically because of the First World War? And we're not involved in it yet. So Wilson, when this war broke out in 1914, Woodrow Wilson encouraged all Americans to be neutral in thought as well as in, in action. Let me say that again. Wilson encouraged Americans to be neutral in thought as well as in action. So show no support to either side and don't even think about showing support to either side, which is kind of a weird thing for a president to recommend. Don't think about supporting one side or another. Do remember that at this point in time in American history, we are very much an immigrant melting pot. Now, the First World War definitely slowed down immigration into Ellis Island from Europe. But that massive wave of immigration that had been developing after the Civil War had created this incredible multicultural America. And there are immigrants and the children of immigrants here in the United States from both sides. There were a lot of Germans living in the United States of America at the time. You know, first generation and second generation German immigrants. And then, of course, America as a whole, most of us speak English. We have a lot of cultural ties to, to, to Britain. We have even stronger economic ties to Britain and France as well. There are a lot of immigrants that came, came over in the late 19th century who were from Central and Eastern Europe. So these would be countries uh, that, that became part of both the Central Powers and the Allies, like Russia. We have plenty of Russians here, Serbians here, Croatians here. Remember Nikola Tesla? He was a Serbian immigrant. So the First World War could have been a very divisive thing for people over here in the United States of America because especially in 1915, Americans would have been very divided in terms of which side they wanted to see win. Okay, so back to Woodrow Wilson. In response to the Lusitania incident, Wilson issued several statements to the leader of Germany. Germany had an emperor at the time. Uh, the German word for emperor was Kaiser. This man's name was Kaiser Wilhelm II or Kaiser William II, if you want to anglicize his name, Kaiser Wilhelm II. So Wilson sent several official letters to Kaiser Wilhelm II threatening Germany, 
stating that if Germany continues in what was identified as unrestricted submarine warfare, then the United States will be forced to intervene on the side of the Allies. So the United States threatens Germany. If you continue this unrestricted submarine warfare, then the United States will get involved on the side of the Allies. Now, a couple of things here. First of all, the Germans do not think the Americans are serious, that the Americans are constitutionally weak, that we don't want to get involved in the war, and all the Americans want to do is simply make money off of the war. And this is what the uh, German ambassadors who are living in Washington, D.C. are reporting to the German government. So the Germans don't think the Americans are going to join, that this is all just an empty threat. And then second, the Germans still are very concerned about the arms and ammunition that's being shipped from the United States to Britain and France. Don't they have a right to stop that traffic, that shipment of war materials? So it's eventually resolved something called the Sussex Pledge, and this doesn't come around until the following year. So there was some back and forth that happened between Germany and the United States. And the Sussex Pledge says this, the German subs will not just shoot non-military vessels out of the water. To repeat the phrase that's important here, the German subs will not continue unrestricted submarine warfare. However, the German subs and the German Navy reserves the right if they know or suspect that arms and ammunition are being shipped across the Atlantic, that they can flag that ship down and that ship has to allow the German soldiers to come on and inspect the ship. And if there's any war material on that ship, then the Germans can confiscate it. Okay, so that's the Sussex Pledge of 1916. It's really annoying. The Germans are like, this is really annoying. Because you're going to have these German soldiers, uh, you know, flag down a ship, go up to the ship, board the ship, try to inspect the entire ship. And the Lusitania is a huge ship. This is a cumbersome, tedious process that's a really a big waste of time. And the German military is like, can't we just blow these ships out of the water? So again, I want to highlight this term again. The Germans feel that they can win if they can just turn loose their subs, start sinking anything in the North Atlantic. And we call that, <laughs> once again, unrestricted submarine warfare. So just know that that idea is lurking in the back of the minds of the German high command. They want to turn loose their subs. They turn loose the subs. They feel like they can win this war. Unrestricted submarine warfare warfare. All right, in 1916, the Germans are still very upset that the United States of America is selling arms and ammunition to some of their enemies, the Allied forces. And so Germany starts doing some things to disrupt this and to sort of scare the Americans, make sure that the Americans never, ever get involved in this war. So here's one of the things that they do. The Germans hired some Americans to work as agents for the German government to infiltrate and an arms and ammunition facility on Black Tom Island, which is in New York Harbor. It's technically part of New Jersey. And in 1916, there are all these guns and ammunitions that were being stockpiled there, getting ready to be placed on a ship to be sent to Russia. So we're selling guns and bullets and stuff to the Russians. All right, so these, essentially these German spies, who are Americans, by the way, but they're working for Germany, they snuck into the facility at Black Tom Island and they blew all this stuff up. The explosion was so big, it created an earthquake in New York City and damaged, symbolically, the foundation of the Statue of Liberty. This was an incredible act of terrorism on American soil. And afterwards, Woodrow Wilson's response, be neutral in thought as well as in action. We're still not getting involved in this conflict. A few weeks later, in Newport, Rhode Island, which is the home of the Naval War College, a very strange thing occurred. <laughs> Off the coast of Newport, a German U-boat just surfaces. Yep, a German U-boat just pops out of the water, comes steaming into dock, docks at Newport, the hatch opens, the commander of the ship gets out of his U-boat onto the dock with a postcard. He walks from the dock up to the Newport War College, asks to see the commanding admiral. The American admiral greets him, and the German admiral asks, 
if he could mail his postcard to his mom back in Germany. This sounds crazy. I know this is exactly what happened. It might seem absurd that a German U-boat would just pop up off the shores of the United States of America, literally dock, and the Admiral jumps out with a postcard and goes to the head admiral of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and asks for that admiral to help him mail it back home to Germany, it seems absurd, it totally happened, and you probably can guess what the Germans are thinking. This all sounds very fun and frivolous, but the Germans were making a very clear gesture to the United States of America. Here's what we just learned. German U-boats can totally sneak up on us without being detected at all. All. They can just pop, show up right here off of our shores. In 1916, the fact that the admiral of the ship wanted to mail a postcard home to his mom in Germany, that was a little bit of a smack in the face to the Americans, that we were just seen as this completely insecure country. Our borders are unfortified. Any submarine can just sneak up on us, and they can send letters back home. Hey, look at what we did. We just surprised the Americans. They had no idea we were coming. This was a clear gesture to the United States of America, stay out of this war. You cannot compete with the German Navy. We can create an earthquake in New York City. We can pop up on your shores anytime we want. And I would say in their efforts at disrupting the United States of America, the Germans weren't too bad. They knew how to mess with us. They also knew how to mess with Russia. Russia didn't fare that well in the First World War. So let me talk a little bit about Russia. You know. Before the war broke out in August of 1914, you might remember that the Russians were the first military to begin mobilizing and preparing for war. And this is actually one of the principal things that caused some German antsiness. And the Germans would say we were forced to invade France through neutral Belgium first because the Russians, even though they didn't actually start fighting, they were very aggressive. They lined up their military on the border with Germany. And if you ha if you have a second here, you check out the map here, you see the the you find Russia and you find Germany, you see they share several hundred miles of a, of a common border. Russia is the biggest country on earth. It has a huge population. They have an army of, get this, nearly six million men. And so this is no small threat to Germany. Now, what Russia doesn't have is a strong merchant class or significant manufacturing power. These are things that the United States does have. Russia is an empire, and for the most part, the structure of society is still very feudal. They've got their leader, who is also an emperor. In Russia, the word for emperor is czar. You have Russian aristocrats, and you have a whole bunch, millions, of German peasants. Russia had struggled in the latter half of the 19th century. At the same time, we've got guys like Carnegie and Rockefeller over here industrializing our country. Russia really struggled with industrialism or rather with industrialization. They just couldn't get it going. So Russia ends up with all of these men, I mean, an army of, like I said, nearly six million men, but they can't make enough guns and especially enough bullets for these men. So you get one year into the war, you've got a soldier with a, with, with a rifle. It's a single shot action rifle. They don't have the same number of machine guns that like the Germans or the British or the French have. They've got rifles. And one year into the war, they were being rationed one bullet a day. That's all they had. They had to ration, <laughs> they had to ration the bullets to the soldiers with the idea that you use your handful of bullets that you have to shoot the German soldiers and to capture their guns and their ammunition. So that's how you need to think of the Russian army at this time. Absolutely huge, but also really weak in terms of their weapons of war. And of course, this is the First World War. This is not a war about the strength of numbers, or at least not the numbers of human beings. This is not a war about valor. This is a war of technology. Whoever has the superior technology is going to win this war. Okay, so what happens? How did things go for Russia when the war began in August of 1914? Well, the first four months of this war actually went quite favorably for the Russians. If you look at this map, which you've looked at several times before, you remember that when the war begins in 1914, it's Germany that strikes first, and Germany invades France through that little triangular-shaped pink country, that's Belgium, 
and Germany throws the weight of their military at France first. That's the Western Front, because it's on the Western border of Germany. They thought they would be able to capture the French capital of Paris within a month, and they thought wrong. They got bogged down in, French, in, in, in trench warfare, the Belgians were fighting back, the Brits got involved, and the Western Front turns into stalemate. Okay, when the Germans invaded France, that was the cue for Russia to invade. So Russia invaded the German Empire from the east. This is the Eastern Front. And the Russians make it a couple of hundred miles into, the, into Germany. And they stayed there for about four months. It was then November of 1914 at a very famous battle called the Battle of Tannenberg. And there were two brilliant German commanders. One was named General Ludendorff, and the other was named General Hindenburg. They were both generals for the Germans. They came up with a brilliant strategy to surround the Russian army, and it worked. They trapped the Russians who were trying to invade into Germany. They had to sort of, the Russians had to funnel in in between these lakes that enabled the German army to go around them, to outflank them, to encircle them. And literally, Ludendorff and Hindenburg were able to capture one million Russians. The Russian commander was so humiliated that he committed suicide. So that was November of 1914. At that point in time, Russia continues to lose, 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 at least against the Germans. The Russians actually still were fighting the Austrians at the same time, and they actually were doing pretty well against the Austrians. But against the Germans, they were losing, losing, losing. But do they give up? No. The leader of Russia at the time was Tsar Nicholas II, and he was a bumbling fool. He was not a great leader for anybody. In 1914, his chief counselor was a nearly six and a half foot tall Siberian psychic who was helping Nicholas II cure his, some of the illnesses in his, in his family and helping him to take his inspiration from God for how to inspire his men. But Nicholas II was quiet, insecure, relatively small, and he would go to the front lines sometimes to try to inspire his men. But he's so awkward, he offers no inspiration whatsoever. And the Russian soldiers, most of them, don't know what they are fighting for. They're being thrown up against the German death machine to fight for Russia, and to fight for what? Why is Russia even involved in this war? I mean, you can ask that of any country. Why is any country involved in this war, except for maybe Austria, Hungary, and Serbia? This war makes no sense to the average person who's fighting it. And maybe the Germans, the French, and the, and, the, and the Brits, and maybe eventually the Americans can say, hey, we're fighting for the strength and pride of our country. But the Russians, it's really hard for a Russian to say that because most of these Russian soldiers are peasants. They come from a background of poverty. They, they, it's clear their government does not really care about them. And they're just being used as cannon fodder against the Germans. So as this war goes on and on and on, and the Russian soldier barely has any food and he's getting rationed one bullet a day to fight to defend his country in a war he doesn't understand for a country he, that doesn't care for him. Eventually, it just occurs to the soldiers, hey, there's a whole bunch of us, there's millions of us, and we have guns. Many of them started defecting. They started leaving uh, the army. They went MIA and they go home. And they start forming local militias to rise up against the government. Russia is ready for revolution. All right. So now when we get to 1917, the Germans come up with a brilliant idea. They know that the majority of Russian people are angry and living in poverty and are fighting in this war that they don't want to fight. The Germans are now invading Russian territory by the time we get to 1917. They're making headway into Russia, but Russia still doesn't give up. Russia will never give up because Nicholas II will never give up. and will just keep throwing these peasant soldiers at the German army. So the Germans know that Russia is ripe for revolution. All the Germans need to do is find somebody to help lead that Russian revolution. And they find that man living in Switzerland. His name was Vladimir Ilyanov Lenin. Lenin was a former middle-class, very well-educated Russian man who saw his big brother, who had developed some radical ideas about creating a new form of government, get arrested and executed by the Tsar's police. And this made Lenin extraordinarily angry, and he vowed revenge against the Tsar. Lenin embraces the radical ideas of Karl Marx, 
He dreams of creating a communist state in Russia. In the ideal communist state, there is no property and no money. Therefore, there's no class structure at all. There's no rich, there's no poor. It's this dream of economic equality. Lenin had spent a lot of time in prison, and when the Russians send you to prison, prison they, they send you to Siberia. Siberia is in northeastern Russia, across the Bering Strait from Alaska. Lenin spent time in a work camp there, as did his wife, who was also a revolutionary. But it did not break their spirit of wanting to lead a revolution in Russia to overthrow the Tsar and his government and to create a new communist state in Russia. Eventually, Lenin had to flee Russia because otherwise he would have spent his entire life in prison, and he ended up in Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is the mountainous country in the center of Europe. If you look at the map, it's not actually labeled on this map, but if you find this country, it's, it's in a darker red. It's in between Germany and Italy and France and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. If you find that little you know, red blotch there in the middle of all of that, that's Switzerland, and that's where Vladimir Lenin was living. And the German plan was this. All we have to do is get Lenin into Russia. He leads a revolution. Once he takes over Russia, we'll make a deal with him. He will end the war on the Eastern Front. There will be peace between Germany and Russia. And Germany will also be able to acquire all of this land in Eastern Europe that they won, taking it from Russia in between November of 1914 and 1917. So that was the plan. Again, Vladimir Lenin, Russian revolutionary, hiding out in Switzerland. Switzerland, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, Switzerland is neutral during this war. They don't fight at all. So the German agents, they go into Switzerland, they find Lenin, they make a deal with them. We'll get you into Russia, we'll help you uh, start your Russian revolution so that you can rule Russia, create your communist state. So we help you out, and in return, you end the war between Russia and Germany, and we get a huge chunk of land in Eastern Europe. Lenin says, deal. So in February of 1917, the German government get Vladimir Lenin onto a train. Famously, this was the sealed train. He was locked in a boxcar in this train. This train goes from Germany up through Sweden and Scandinavia through Finland to the capital city of Russia of St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg was the capital of Russia at the time, not Moscow. And just to be technical, St. Petersburg at the time was actually called Petrograd. At this time, February of 1917, there were actually women protesting on the streets of St. Petersburg or Petrograd because they had no food. So it was a bread march for food and the government of Russia was not giving them any pay or compensation for their sons and their husbands going off to fight for war, or fight at war. So at this point in time in history, when your man leaves and there's no men left in the house, then there's nobody there to make money to help provide. So they expected the government to provide and the government wasn't providing because the government of Russia is broke. I can't provide for anybody at this time. And so people are starving in the streets of Petrograd. So the women are protesting in Petrograd and this was causing a revolution. So it's not long after this that Vladimir Lenin shows up in Russia to start his revolution. The government was on to him. They stopped his revolution from happening in the summer of 1917, and he actually goes into the neighboring country of Finland. He goes into hiding. He disguises himself, which is sort of what you see on the screen here, Vladimir Lenin disguising himself. That's the that's Lenin in disguise there on the right. But then things continued to deteriorate throughout the summer into the fall of 1917, and, and then in October. Of 1917, Lenin shows back up. In Russia, this was Red October. The amount of time it took Vladimir Lenin and his fellow communists, they were called the Bolsheviks, which means the majority in Russian. They actually weren't the majority of Russians, the Bolsheviks, but they were a very powerful minority. And they said they represent, represented the masses, which is why they called themselves Bolsheviks. So these Bolshevik communist revolutionaries that were led by Lenin. How long did it take him to overthrow the government? 10 days, 10 days. Lenin takes over Russia. We have a successful Russian revolution in October of 1917. Vladimir Lenin becomes the first communist leader in world history. The Tsar and his family are eventually all executed and buried in an unmarked grave in the Ural Mountains. Lenin sends one of his chief advisors, a guy by the name of Leon Trotsky, to go meet with a German high command. 
in a town of, in, in Poland called Brest-Litovsk, where they sign a treaty ending the war on the Eastern Front between Russia and Germany and the rest of the Central Powers, Austria and the Ottomans. The year is 1917. This plan that the Germans had been concocting the year before works. So what's the implications of this? How does this affect the United States of America all the way over on the other side of the earth? Look at the map. Look at that map. The Germans have had to split their army between the Western Front, fighting the French with their British allies, and the Russians on the Eastern Front, fighting the six million men in the Russian army. Now, with the war concluded on the Eastern Front against the Russians, and having acquired a whole bunch of new land there in Eastern Europe, the Germans can begin shipping all of their men with all their guns and all their bullets and all their cannon, all their tanks, all their poison gas, all their flamethrowers, all their machine guns. They can start shipping all that stuff from the Eastern Front in Russia to the Western Front against the French and the British. The Germans are going to wait until the spring of 1918 and then, against the French and the British, they're going to unleash hell. The Germans are going to finally be able to win this war in the spring of 1918. France and Britain are exhausted. They've been fighting this war as well for four years. They've exhausted their industry, their economy. A whole generation of British and French boys have died. Numbers that we in our American history, in, in, the, in, in our military history, we, we've never been in a war where we've lost a million men. And that has happened to both the British and the French. It's devastating. So in this war of attrition, the Germans just got a huge morale boost. They've ended the war on the Eastern Front. They've acquired land. Now in March of 1918, they expect the, to win. The only thing that could possibly save France and Britain from being conquered by the Germans would be the presence of a fresh, new, huge army. Woodrow Wilson had run for re-election in 1916. So if you remember, he was elected for the first time in 1912. So four years later, 1916 was his campaign to run for re-election. When he ran for re-election in 1916, his campaign slogan was, he kept us out of the war. For the American people, that meant war against Mexico and war in, in Europe, the First World War. Woodrow Wilson was a pacifist. He gets reelected in November of 1916, retakes the oath of office of the presidency in late January of 1917, and within three months, Wilson will stand before the Congress of the United States of America and ask for a declaration of war against Germany. America is showing up to fight in the First World War. Question is, in such a short period of time, in between getting reelected with his campaign slogan, Wilson, he kept us out of the war, to within a half a year declaring war on Germany, what happened? So we will learn what happened, how the United States of America finally gets involved in this war, what we do to turn the tide of this war, the experiences of the American soldier in this war, how this war finally comes to an end and the very important peace treaty that ends the First World War. We will learn all, all, all about these things in the next lecture. That concludes this lecture, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.